Another basic proof technique is called proof by cases, in which we prove something by breaking it up into pieces that are easy to prove, but that together cover all possibilities. Let's look at an explicit, simple example from computer science. Here's a Java logical expression. Um, the way to decipher this is that the double vertical bar means or in Java, and the double ampersand means and in Java. So this is a, uh, a conditional test, an if test, that is the guard on a bunch of code to be executed if this test comes out to be true. Let's read the test. If x is greater than 0, or if x is less than or equal to 0, and y is greater than 100, go ahead and do the code that's in there indicated by the vertical dots. We're going to assume here that x and y are variables that are declared to be of type floating point or real number or integers for that matter. Okay. Now what I claim is that this code can be improved if it's rewritten in the following way, namely um, if uh, x is greater than 0 or y is greater than 100. So the claim is that these two hunks of code, if I just replace this test, which has three components that re require an extra step to evaluate in some cases, um, by this code, the programs are going to behave exactly the same way, and therefore it's just more efficient and easier to understand and runs one step faster if I replace this longer expression by this shorter expression. Now, how do I argue that these two pieces of code are going to behave in exactly the same way, or you know, come up with the same final output? They won't behave exactly the same because one will be faster than the other, but they're going to yield the same results. Okay, let's consider how these two behave in two cases. The first case will be that the number x really is positive, that it's greater than zero. What happens then? Well, the first test above in the OR comes out to be true. And that means that the whole OR expression is true, because when you have a true OR anything at all, it comes out to be true, and you go ahead and execute the code that follows. Likewise, the second expression starts with x greater than 0 OR, so it comes out to be true. So in this case, if x is greater than 0, both conditional expressions will allow the code that follows them to be executed, and because they both evaluate to true. Okay. The next case is that x is less than or equal to 0. Let's see what happens then. Well, in the top expression, since x is less than or equal to 0, that first expression, x greater than 0, when if it's evaluated, returns false. And same thing in the second expression. The initial test, x greater than 0, returns false. Now, one of the things that the way OR works is that if you have an OR of a bunch of things, if the first thing is false, you ignore it and just proceed to the other things uh, to see how they come out. So what that means is that in both of these expressions, since the first test in the sequence of things that are being ORed together came out to be false, I can just ignore them. The code is going to behave as though uh, after the false was detected, it's just going to behave in the same way that the rest of the test says to behave. Well, in the top case, the expression to be checked now is that x is less than or equal to 0 and y is greater than 100. But what do we know? Well, x is greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to 0 in this case. So this test comes out to be true, and we have something of the form true and something or other. That means that the net outcome of this expression it depends entirely on the something or other. That is, it depends entirely on whether y is greater than 0, because the x is less than or equal to 0. And so this expression can be simplified. It's going to behave exactly uh, according to whether or not y is greater than 100. So look what I've just done. I've argued that in this case, both of these test guards act like y is the test y greater than 100, which is they behave the same in this case as well. So what I just figured out was that in both cases, these two expressions yield the same result, which means, and the only possible cases are that x is less than 0, or uh, that x is greater than 0, or less, x is less than or equal to 0. So in all cases, they're the same, and we're done. That's why it's safe to replace the upper complicated expression 
by the lower, less complicated expression. So in general, as I said, reasoning by cases breaks complicated problems into easier subproblems, which is what we just saw there. Uh, wouldn't be clear how to prove that these two things were equivalent, but I chose those cases and it made each case easy to figure out that the two things were the same. Now, the truth is that there are some philosophers who worry about reasoning by cases for kind of subtle reasons. Um, they're called intuitionists, and here's what bothers them. Let, let me illustrate it. There's a million dollar Clay Institute question, one of, uh, I think, a dozen or so questions that are considered to be the major open problems in various disciplines of mathematics. And one of the disciplines of mathematics is complexity theory in computer science, computational complexity theory. This question is known as the P equals NP question. And we're actually going to talk about it a fair amount uh, in just the coming few lectures. But for now, it doesn't matter what it means. Well, I'll tell you what it means. P stands for polynomial time, and NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. I'm not going to define non-deterministic polynomial time, but uh, it would be momentous if those two things were equal. Uh, and everyone expects that they're not equal, but no one knows how to prove that. So the million dollar question is, is P equal to NP, yes or no? And you get a million dollars for settling this question. Now, I claim that, in fact, the answer to this question is on my lecture table, and I will show it to you in class tomorrow.